Sure. Well, good morning, everyone. It is an honor and a privilege to gather with you all this morning as we join together to worship our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we gather together, we hope that you grabbed one of these. If you have one, wave it around in the air like this. Yeah, cool. Um, so if you didn't grab one um, on your way in today, make sure you grab one on your way out. Um, it just It's a really great place to see what's going on around the church community, how you can plug in, how you can serve, and then also just different ways that we're able to pray for you and pray for each other and who you can be praying for as well. Um, so, And of course, we have our announcements and we have our time of prayer together, but it's so, so wonderful when you can also look here and be able to pray as well. And uh, if you brought your tithes and your offerings, you can uh, drop that at the plates that we'll have at the back at the end of the service. And there's a place on our website to give as well, if you would like to do that. And if you're new with us or you're joining us online um, or you've not been coming for very long, we hope that you'd fill out one of the welcome cards in the pocket in front of you in your pew. Uh, we also have a place on our website for that as well. It's just a wonderful way for us to get to know you, to uh, make sure that we know how we can be praying for you and help you get connected here. And it's just our goal that we can make you feel as welcome as possible as we all continue into this crazy life that the Lord has called us into and gives us the opportunity to serve and to be in a relationship with him. So before we begin our time in singing this morning, will you bow your heads as we center upon his word? Dear Lord, we thank you so, so much for how wonderful and how gracious, how powerful and how righteous you are. We thank you that no matter where we are in our lives, that you are walking with us. Lord, we know that when you, we acknowledge you, we ask you into our hearts and we give our entire existence to you, our body, our soul, our mind, and our strength, and our hearts and our everything, Lord. Lord, when we give that all to you, you change us permanently. You wipe our sins clean and you set us on a path of righteousness. So Lord, this morning, if there's anyone that does not know you or has not experienced what it means to be a follower of you, and does not understand what it means to be your creation, your children, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would reveal that in their hearts today. Lord, we love you so much. We lift your praises, and Lord, we sing to glorify and honor you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you stand, please turn to your neighbors and greet them and welcome them and say, I am so glad that you are here today. Jesus Christ the righteous 
I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. So come together, sons and daughters. Part with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son, and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Amen. Our God will finish what He started. Yeah. This is my testimony from death to life. Grace rewrote my story. I testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Still to come, oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. If you're not done, you're not done. Greater things still to come, oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things still to come, oh, I testimony death to life cause grace rewrote my story so I testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony oh, this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Amen. 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 <laughs> I don't know about you, man, but from death to life, are you kidding me, man? From darkness to light? That's what Christ can do. And it's real. It's real. Father, this morning, don't let that story get old. May our hearts and lives be, come to a deeper realization what you actually did for us on the cross. This is, this is life changing, oh God, and we thank you for the power of the cross, the blood to cover our sins. But man, we're so glad for the power of the resurrection that gives us new life. We don't have to be ashamed. We can stand because Jesus, you're the only one that came back from the dead. You're the only one that sits at the right hand of God the Father on high. You're the only one that is interceding for us right now. You're the only one that sent your Holy Spirit that we might have comfort and help and peace in these troubling times. You're the only one that gave us your word. We stand on your promises, oh God. We stand on the blood of Jesus to cover our sins. I thank you, God, this new life is so real. If there's someone here this morning that needs that change, Father, would you reveal it through the power of your Holy Spirit. Settle down. Settle down, Holy Spirit, on us. Move in our midst. Awaken us, O oh God. Awaken us, O oh God. Help us as we sing this prayer to you this morning in Jesus' name. Or 
us through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same
that's right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You touch the lepers then. I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. Let's continue singing together. Man, as we're singing this song, let this be your prayer. Pray it to God. Pray it to God.
eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion in your holy church. Let's sing that together. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Uh, that song you just sang is packed, packed with theologic, theological truths. And that those truths are under attack. Uh, people are stepping away from those basic truths. And as I hear you singing them, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged um, and be encouraged. For Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, and that's not a bumper sticker. That's real deal. And when you sing those truths, you sing them to be so. Would you bow your heads with me? With your heads bowed, I want to read something to you. And I think men, some or even many of us might be needing to hear this today. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Father, these promises that you have seasoned your word with all through the scriptures, Old Testament and the New give us pause and give us praise praise for what you do and who you are the creator of all that is and through your son there was not anything made that was made in him the word was life and the life was the light of men light shines in the darkness <laughs> and the darkness shall not nor will ever overcome it with our hearts humble before you we recognize these truths that you are who you say you are and that you are faithful <laughs> for this I call to mind and therefore I have hope the steadfast love of the Lord never comes to an end. His mercies never cease. They are new every morning. Father, great is your faithfulness. We confess, Father, that there are times that we don't act that way. There are times that we take the, the rudder ourselves. We take the wheel of our lives and make a hash of it. Forgive us. Forgive us for putting our hope anywhere else but you. And we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your love. We thank you for friends and family, for simple stuff like water and food and shelter and that beater that brought us here today. We thank you. Thank you for your incredible generosity in our lives. We thank you for the good report in Emily Cherry. <laughs> Thank you that uh, your mercies were in the hands of doctors and even before, of course, 
as they opened and found your work had already begun. Thank you. Lord, we thank you for your healing touch upon our lives, and we ask you to continue in your healing. Continue, Lord, reconciling us to yourself and to and reconciling us to each other. We thank you that uh, you are the one who makes ends meet in our finances, so we lift them up to you and say, Lord, make them work because we need your help. Maybe some of us are wondering about jobs or next steps or a tough report from the doctor. The list goes on. Lord, we put that all in your hands and ask for your healing, your reconciliation, and your very great power. We ask that for ourselves. We ask that for those who have asked for particular prayer, including Emily Cherry, for Fran Dean as she goes into her last week in Uganda and prepares to return home. Keep her safe, her and the whole team. Uh, for uh, Mary Jewel's daughter, Stacy, bless her with healing, along with Adriana Stewart, Constance Sakotis, Bev White, Barb Steinard, Janice Dorto, and Martha Halbert. For Kim Swanger, Sharon Madison, and Jenny Miller. For Becky DuPois, Thelma Kayser, Allison, and Adam Coffey, and Melanie Ohm. Lord, we thank you for our student leaders that are off on a conference at 3SLI this weekend. Bless each one and their leaders, Pastor Jenny and Steve. Um, I pray that uh, not only will this weekend be life-changing, uh, but their journey back safe and their opportunities abound in sharing that with others. We thank you for those who have recently graduated. For our shut-ins, we thank you for them. And we ask you also that you would watch over each along with those who come together and bring music together, music and words and so much more. Lord, uh, you, have, <clears throat> you have put us in a nation that needs your help, in a nation that desperately needs to keep their eyes focused on you or return to a focus on you. For every leader, I pray that they would bow their knees before you and ask for your wisdom and carry it out so that you may receive the glory. Forgive us in this nation for setting our minds and eyes away from the motto found on every dollar bill in God we trust. Today we open up your word and we ask that you would guide us through it so that we might be the good stewards of what you've given us. Good stewards in this life as you prepare us for eternity. We ask it in the name of Jesus and all his people said, amen, amen. Well, uh, my announcers are gone, so you get to deal with me. Uh, would you please get your worship folders out? And uh, <clears throat> as you get your worship folders out, I'm going to guide you through them on what's going on. <clears throat> now, before I do that, though, in your uh, pew pocket in front of you is a little card, right? And, and online, it's online. It's on the website, uh, just a, a way to, uh, to welcome you, but also uh, to, to tell you what's going on here at uh, East Canton uh, Church of God. And, and, you know, we have been praising God for all the guests that have been coming. And we see the Holy Spirit's movement, not only in your lives, uh, but in all, in all the lives of this church. We see it. And we sense it, and we're so grateful for it. Uh, but we'd like to reach out to you and let you know what's going on here at East Canton Church of God. So if you're a guest, please fill this out. And uh, how many of, here, of you have prayer requests? Raise your hands. Oh, you know, I don't have that many cards at the end of Sunday, typically. So I encourage you to fill out a card so we can pray with you. Some of you already have, and I thank you for that. But if you haven't, Today's a great day to do that. Also, if uh, you are wanting a Bible reading plan, these yellow um, uh, bookmarks, they're out there in the uh, lobby behind you, the narthex. Pick those up if you haven't already done so. You see on one side the, the days of March and what we'll be reading, and then the, the uh, uh, helpful instructions on how to accomplish that as you go to the Lord and ask for his guidance. 
uh, in your worship folder that I ask you to get out. You faithfully did. Um, I already covered the first part, and that was the welcome, because the welcome requires a welcome card. So we've already talked about that. Uh, we have church directories. Uh, some of you have participated in that. Some uh, weren't able to or decided not to. That's fine. But if you have a, if you have put your information in and you'd like that worship directory, we a directory. We have that downstairs. Did I say worship directory? Um, church directory. Sorry. Uh, with uh, some pictures, but a lot of information so we can get to know one another. And if you'd like to be in it, it is set up so that we could add people. That's a good thing, right? And so if you'd like to be in it and are not already, please fill out uh, our cards downstairs or these welcome cards and we'll get a hold of you and have you put in there. Uh, Easter flowers, every Easter, I love walking into this room at Easter and smelling because I, my sense of smell isn't that really good, but I can really smell these flowers that are up here. So people order flowers and then they take them home for Easter and then some are left and we take them to shut-ins. Uh, Easter flowers could be ordered by uh, next Sunday, the 12th. Also, um, we have a, a lunch coming up on the 19th. Please, in your calendars, write, stay for lunch. Only three words, stay for lunch after the 19th because we're going to have uh, some barbecue. You're not going to want to miss that. My bride's going to uh, help me uh, do that with the Ugandan team as we raise funds for Uganda. So please uh, be a part of that. And um, lastly, uh, two things actually. Uh, we have, pe we have uh, young ones who have graduated from high school and are going into their lives, some in college, some uh, college that have been far away, some close, some are going into the trades, some are going into just employment for now. <clears throat> so we uh, are wanting to encourage them. So you see that on here, post-grad care baskets, read the instructions, and please provide a, a, an encouraging note to these precious ones uh, of our community. And now, last... Uh, on Easter Sunday morning, we hope to have a choir. And, you know, I heard you sing just a few moments ago. Some of you can sing really well, and some of you are still practicing, and that's okay. Regardless of where you are in that group, please uh, sign up for choir. We'd love to see uh, that whole, this whole thing filled with voices. There's, you know what? And all the voices that you, or all the uh, instruments that you just heard, there's one that was God made. That's our voice. And the uh, praises of God are inhabited in the praises of his people. So uh, please get your Bibles out and go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Um, that was a long intro. But uh, <clears throat> here, here's, a, here's a memory I have. Uh, so I was uh, in the service. Some of you were as well. And, and uh, as, as I entered into that first week of basic training, some people call it boot camp, um, it was a little daunting, I could tell you. I mean, I, I, my oldest son, when he went in, he, he was told, just get to the next day. This guy was just trying to get to lunch, just to get to the next meal because it was so crazy. Well, as you get through boot camp basic training, it gets a little different. I, I could tell that the, uh, that the dr drill instructors treated me different in the eighth week than they did the first week because we had built up trust. And, and not only that, they taught me things in the eighth week that they didn't teach in the first week because I wasn't ready for it, right? And the same thing goes for school. Thankfully, they don't teach you in first grade what they're trying to teach in seventh grade. Can anyone say amen to that, right? right? And then in seventh grade, they don't teach you what's going to be in 12th grade because you're not ready for it yet. And so there's, there's age-appropriate learning, but there's also spiritually mature-appropriate learning. There's stuff that we can handle now and stuff that we can't. And God, thankfully, knows the difference. And as we've been studying in, in uh, Luke chapter 9, we learned a couple of Sundays ago that Jesus turned his gaze toward the cross. His face, the Bible says, it was like flint. Wasn't going anywhere. He wasn't going to be distracted. He wasn't going to be talked out of it. He was going to Jerusalem. And as he was going, he's throwing off these important lessons for his disciples. Lessons that would be life-changing. Lessons that they needed to fulfill what God had called them to do. Because I don't know if you know this, there was never a plan B. Have you ever read about the disciples? They were cantankerous. They were bickering. 
think Jesus called them dull. I mean, they weren't seemingly what people would pick as the leaders of the Christian world. But Jesus chose them. And he says, you 11, because we know one was a betrayer, you 11, your plan A. How's no pressure? And as they go through that plan A, Jesus is teaching them. And one of my favorite chapters of the Bible is what we're going to talk about today, Luke chapter 12. And in that chapter, Jesus is helping them understand a concept that may, they may not have thought of, and that is the concept of stewardship. Say that word with me, stewardship. So think of stewardship as you read this, as I read this scripture. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 35. And if you stand, I'll read as you follow along. Some may wonder why we do this. It's just a, a way to honor God's word as we, uh, as we open up our, our teaching time, okay? I'm beginning again in verse 35 of chapter 12 of Luke. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve him, serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour. You do not expect. Now Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master's delayed in coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did not what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much is given of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand all the more. May God bless us as we study his word. Please be seated. Thank you again for standing. So what does it mean to be a good steward. Now, briefly, I, I, I want to talk about steward, what that word means. You don't hear that often on the nightly news, but it's a very important word. Uh, I've been in leadership development quite a while, and I've uh, grown weary of people being called managers. It's a title, and there's nothing wrong with that, but actually, people are led, things are managed. Does that make sense? Okay. People are led, so that's why I call you leaders, Managers manage things. No, they're all managing things and needs to be done properly. But stewards are, is an important word for two reasons. One is that it covers both, right? You could be a steward of stuff. You could be a steward of people. Okay, so that's good. But the second thing is, is all the more important. A steward is one who does not own what that person stewards. He's doing it for somebody else. And we know as Christ followers that everything we've been given, even if our title is on the car or our name's on the title of the car or name's on the title of the, of the house, who does it really belong to? It belongs to the Lord. So the steward is, is an important word. And as I, as I read this, I, there was a, a word called faithful and wise manager in the English Standard Version. Uh, other people describe it as uh, other... Uh, Versions describe it as steward. That's the, the name that I prefer. And so, question, what does it take to be a faithful steward? What does it take to be a good steward? That's what we're going to look at today. So in this, by the way, in this parable, it's it just crammed full with imagery, with symbolism, okay? This means that you don't read this and go, oh, 
I guess I get to get a job as a servant of the house and look for the master when he comes. Good news, you don't have to do that. But this is symbolism of everything that God has called you to do, either as a steward or as a servant. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. So the first is be, stay alert, be dressed for action. And stay dressed for action. If we took that literally, and, and, and even as Jesus was saying it to his disciples, he said, uh, gird your loins for action. That's another thing we don't hear in the news, do we? We see the results of it, but we don't ever see it itself. And so what happens is, um, you know, in that time, they wore uh, flowing garments, okay? So that means that they would have a tunic, and typically, as I understand it, a tunic would uh, come over the head, over the shoulders, and maybe come to the knee, maybe even longer. And uh, on top of the tunic was a, was a, was a, uh, a cloak, perhaps. But it was flowing. And so to gird loins for action means that you have to kind of get everything going and twist it around so your legs are free to be in motion. Does that make sense to you today? Because otherwise you would trip, you'd fall, exactly. And so as we, uh, as we think of what biblically that could help us with, uh, Hebrews 12, chapter 1 would help here. Hebrews 1, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and for those of know, you who know your Bible, you know that means those who have gone before us, but also those who are surrounding us now, and those who's, uh, who will eventually look at our legacy. So it's a pretty big group. Okay, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also, here it is, lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That's the picture when we see stay dressed for action. You see, you cannot stay dressed for action. You cannot be alert. You cannot serve as a steward if you're laid aside, if you are uh, uh, weighted down with the ways of the world, the weights of the world, and the sin that clings so closely. You can't stay alert if that happens. You can't stay alert if you are living with unconfessed sin. It weighs upon you. We'll talk about that in a moment. Because even though we talk about the, the, uh, ourselves as four ways, you know, the body, the soul, the spirit, the mind, you know, and it's okay to look at that, but ultimately we are an integral person. We have integrity. We, we are linked together. What we do in one is going to affect the other. Does that make sense to you today? So if you are, in other words, if you are struggling with sin, that's going to affect your body. It's going to affect your mind and so on. But also it's not just sin, that, that unconfessed sin that can weigh us down. It's actually misplaced priorities can do that. Let me uh, give you an example. You know, we can have uh, friends. I mean, good things, by the way. Friends or family or country or community or hobbies or food, whatever it may be, even though it might be good, an unhealthy approach to it can weigh us down. Give, me, uh, give you an example. Uh, when I was much younger, I loved to play softball. I enjoyed it. And until one day, I was coming around third, heading toward home, and my hamstring broke. They could hear the snap around me. And now, by the way, I did make it home. So just to let you know, that was done. But that was at a great cost because my leg is never the same since. My left leg has never been the same because of that injury. I focused so much on running hard in softball that it affected everything else. Sometimes even a good priority, even one that God has given you, can be blow itself out of proportion to the point where we're letting that weigh us down. Does that make sense to you this morning? Yes? Yeah. And not only weight of priority, but actually weight of our responsibility can, can weigh us down if it's done with the, right, with the wrong balance. We can't be ready, loved ones, if we continue to fall down. We can't be ready, but we can be ready when we seek God's strength to lift us up, brush us off, get us a right path and do it again. See, in that integrity of, our, of, our, of ourselves, David talks about it in uh, Psalm chapter 32. If you're taking notes, just write Psalm 32, 1 to 5. He says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity 
and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Stop right there. Okay, so this is the, the ideal. If one who is a good steward is going to have this relationship, one who uh, the Lord counts, uh, in, in whom counts, the Lord counts no iniquity, whose spirit there is no deceit, someone who is reconciled with the Lord. Another way of thinking of that is one who has short accounts with the Lord. Okay, secondly, go on. For when, Paul, uh, David writes, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Again, this is the, nation, the notion that our sin, if we do not do something about it, will weigh us down and change us physically. We, are integ we have integrity in that way. Our, our bodies and our souls and our minds and our spirits are interrelated. Inter, uh, but, David goes on, when I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Loved ones, this is really good news that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and do one more thing. Do you remember? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's very good news. A good time to say amen right there. Amen, amen. amen. So make no mistake, if we're struggling to stay alert to the presence of God and his work in our life, chances are that we are allowing ourselves to be tripped up by our own distractions and perhaps even our sin. But when we keep short accounts with God, we stay alert. And as we stay alert, then we can do the next thing, and that is to keep our lights or lamps burning. Again, this is not to be taken literally. This is a symbolism. It's not that we are to buy up all the lamps in Canton and Canton area and maybe down in Carroll County and put it up in front of our house. You don't have to do that. But it, what it does mean is that whatever light God has given you, you are to keep that burning. You know, again, I, I tell you often to keep reading your Bibles. I, this is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible, and I've read it a lot, and I never pick this up. The lamps that are burning are the works of of righteousness that God has allowed us to put, produce in the lives of others. That's what that lamp is. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. These are the lights of our good works. Not, by the way, not to save us, no, but to, be, to act as markers of who we are. Not to earn anything, but to light up not only our own lives, but the lives around us as we are dedicated to Christ. When Jesus says, let your light shine before others so that that the, the, they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven, that is an example of keeping your lamps burning, actively looking, actively generous with ourselves. We learned that last week, to live generous lives. And when we are alert and when we keep our lamps burning, then the scripture says, we are, or Jesus says, we are to be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast. Now, what does that mean to be waiting? In the, in, the, in the original language, it means to be actively waiting, okay? This does not mean like you're in the doctor's office playing Tetris on your phone. That's not what it means. It means to be actively waiting, actively serving the Lord as you wait for his return. David, again, in Psalm 27, 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. You can see that there's an urgency in it. It's not just sitting around waiting for Jesus to come. It's far more than that. You know, I've told you about my Uncle Carl and how he, he, he lived a life where it's almost as if he's talking to you and looking over your shoulder just to see if Jesus is coming around the corner. He was actively waiting for Jesus to return, and that's good. But there's more than that. It's not only waiting for him to come, it's waiting for him to prepare us for his arrival. Prepare us for his arrival. There's so much more. Looking for his work in your life and in the lives of others. Looking for his healing. Looking for his release of others from oppression. Working, seeing his work in justice and in peace. And then seeing his leadership in his word, in prayer in dreams. 
His work, loved ones, can be seen if we look for it. We see it in creation. We see it in changed lives. I was talking to uh, Larry today, and he went to a men's conference yesterday. He heard a bunch of testimonies about men whose lives were changed. I can't tell you how many people you walk by every day whose lives are changed by Jesus and who others need to hear your story about how Jesus has changed your life. Amen? So, preparing, actively preparing for our own meeting with him. This is the reality of, of life, you know, and the older I get, the more real it becomes. It, it, I, I used to grow up right next to a, when I grew up, I grew up next to a, a graveyard. And, you know, I didn't even think about dying, but it's going to happen. Did you know that? It's appointed, the Bible says, it's appointed for men and women to die once and after that face judgment. We don't like to think about that, but it's the reality of it. And so not only that, to, to face judgment, but we get to face judgment by Christ. For we must all appear, this is um, 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. This is a reality that we have. And loved ones, it's a reality that Jesus knows we have. And he's preparing us for it. How? Every single day he's preparing you. Did you know that? I know you may think yesterday, boy, that was a bad day. Jesus was right in the thick of it trying to prepare you. Last week, when you lost your temper and you recovered from it, Jesus is right there with you. Why do I know that? Because as Jesus... As Jesus says, look, look at me, I got your future. I just need you to focus on today. Today. In Joshua 1, verse 9, it's, it's something you can find on Pinterest. It's one of those verses that they're so prevalent. It's one more, uh, one more uh, verse that we could take out of context. But I'm trying to take it in context today, okay? Joshua 1, 9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong. Be courageous. Do not be frightened or do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That message was for or was uh, to Joshua, but also for us. As God walks with us, he's with you today, is with you today. It's present tense. So that tomorrow, when it's today, he will be with you. The day after tomorrow, when it becomes today, he will be with you. So he is with you. Loved ones, that should give you great courage today as you seek to be prepared for his coming because he's preparing you for that day. Every day we live each day with God, seeking his work in our lives and watching for his preparation. So today, while it's today, put your trust in him. Don't wait. Don't wait till tomorrow. Today, he said he's with you today. That's why you're here. He, you recognize that he is with you today. Be prepared and to be prepared for a good day on that day. I've told you often, loved ones, as your pastor, I really want you to have a good day on that day. Don't miss the preparation he's leading you through today. Now, it talks about if someone is, is going to be awake in the second watch and the third watch, that they will be especially blessed. The watches come from the, uh, the uh, Roman Praetorium where the first watch was from 6 to 9 p.m., the second watch was from the 9 to midnight, and then the third watch was midnight to 3. Now, God's, again, not telling you to stay up till 3 every day, but he is re recognizing that some of us in our lives are in different watches. Some of you are in the first watch. You're young, you're learning, and you're growing, and that's good. But some of us are in the second watch. And some of us that have been seasoned with many years are in the third watch. See, loved ones, God wants you to be faithful to the end. He wants you to be faithful to the end, all the way to the end, all the way to that very last day when you see him face to face. And he's preparing you for it. And if, you have ble if you're blessed many years and you finish strong, I, I see it right here. You're going to be blessed, super blessed. God's going to welcome you in and be so grateful for what your obedience to him as he prepared you 
every day. The longer we stay faithful as good stewards, the more blessings we receive. Those blessings aren't the goal, loved ones. They are evidence of God's work in your life. For those who are blessed with many years, God's called you to finish strong. Stay alert to the very end. Keep your lamps burning. And that's interesting. You know, we, uh, why do you put lights on on the outside of your house? For your friends to find it or to keep thieves away? Probably to keep thieves away. Many of us do. Make sure it's all lit up. That's not the purpose of keeping your lamps burning. Remember, to keep your lamps burning is so that the master will come home to light. So keep your lamps burning so that when Jesus finally comes, he'll be ready. He will see, he'll be ready, but he will see your lamps burning. Now in this passage, Jesus talks about reward and consequence. This is right after Jesus, or Peter asked a question. So is this for us or for them? And Jesus, did you notice, he doesn't really answer. He does that all the time. He asks a question, he goes, that's interesting, keep going. But he, effectively, the answer is yes, right? Is this for us or for all? It's for all of you. It's for yes, you as leaders, but also those that will be led by you. These are the rewards and the consequences. He first begins talking about stewards or managers. A faithful manager or steward does what that person's been privileged to do on behalf of the one who gave him the privilege. And, and this is a good stopping point to remember this, that responsibility from God is a privilege, not a punishment. I'll say that again. Responsibility that God gives you is a privilege, not a punishment. It is a reward, not a rebuke. It is a joy, not a chore. Often, has anyone else felt like some of the things God gives you is a chore? God's using you in that way, that chore, that responsibility to grow as he prepares you for that day. Providing for others, the more responsibility you have, is a privilege and a reward. And I think we need to stop behaving as if it's a drag, if it's, as if it's a chore. Now, he goes on and says, here's what the unfaithful manager's like. This guy just simply does what is selfish. He does what is selfish instead of what is right. The parable cuts deep against those who use others for selfish gain, no matter what situation it could be in, even in the church or in the family or in the school or in the workplace or in the community. And here we see that the unfaithful manager will be caught by his master and cut to pieces. Does that bother anyone else? Okay, so I think it's more accurate to say he will be cut into two. The word is bisect, cut into two pieces because two pieces reflects the division in this person, the deceit in this person, saying one thing, doing another. Does that make sense? If, if you want what that means when you look like you're one of the faithful, but actually you're not, and that is, that is revealed in those moments. We were cut into two and placed with the unfaithful to recognize that the reality that Jesus talks about often in the scriptures is true, that one day there will be a judgment. The faithful will be led into heaven and the unfaithful will not be. And as we, as we, as we consider that, recognize that he's, he's building on what he, what he taught the disciples back in, earlier in the chapter. If you have your Bible open, Go to uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 4. Luke chapter 12, verse 4. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he is killed has the authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. All through until he got to verse 35 and that we read, Jesus is talking about the reality of God who judges justly as well as the realities of our own fears and our own uncertainties and our own worries. And Jesus is saying that the, the, the worry that, or the, the, the fear of the Lord leads us to be prepared so that we are not cast out to the, to the unfaithful, that we are not considered those who are, who are cut into two but instead are proven faithful. You see, this, pers this particular uh, unfaithful steward is put with the unfaithful and the action proves that he does not belong as he projected to be, as his responsibilities indicated that he was. 
Jesus again describes that there are consequences to unfaithfulness. But here's the general message that I don't want you to lose out on. There's so many who struggle with the idea of heaven and hell, even though the Bible's very clear about it. But here in this message, recognize this, that God judges justly. There's no other being in the universe that judges like God does. And believe me, I don't want that job, do you? No, God has it. And he will, in heaven or in hell, make sure that everyone is treated as justly as only he can. Now, that's the, the, the stewards. But what about the, the faithful and unfaithful? He has a story about those who know better and get caught will be treated severely. Those who didn't know better and were caught will be treated lightly. All this is describing, again, is the judgment, the perfect judgment of God. Let me give you uh, a help here in John 14, 21. Whoever has his commands and keeps them, it is he who loves me. First, we have to have his commands, yes? And then we can love him because we'll do it. Whoever has my commands, then we can keep him, keep them. And it, he it is who loves Jesus. But more importantly, and some of you who are in the uh, program that we have, the, the Bible reading, we just went over 1 Corinthians 3, and here's a passage from it that helps. This is chapter 3, verses 11 to 15. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day that judgment we've been talking about will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If the work that, is any, that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he'll receive a reward. Now recognizing the reward is a, is a marker of faith, faithfulness. If anyone's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Loved ones, Stay faithful to the Lord, listen and learn and keep focused on him and God will judge justly. Again, a great time to say amen. God has reasonable expectations, but what he gives you, he expects you to use for his kingdom. And that's really un not unreasonable, is it? That which he gives you, that he, he, he gives so that you could use it for his kingdom. What God entrusts you with, he expects you to act with it in a trustworthy way. But in this, trust is a two-way street. We trust Christ for our relationship with him, our salvation against sin, his righteousness placed within us, regenerated and born again by the Holy Spirit. We trust him in that way, and then he trusts us to be good stewards with what he gives. We trust him to give us what we need so that we can be ready. In your notes, Jesus calls us to be prepared and so we look for Jesus, we learn from Jesus, and we lead with Jesus. Would you read that with me, please? Jesus calls us to be prepared. Look for Jesus, learn from Jesus, lead with Jesus. Long ago, when sin entered the world, God had a plan. And that plan was made manifest in the Son of God. His name is Jesus. And according to the scriptures... He was killed on a cross so that you and I can have salvation from our sins, so that we could be reconciled to God. That was foretold centuries, thousands of years before. And then there's more. Also by those same scriptures, he was foretold and did rise from the grave. That's why we're here on Sundays, by the way, to celebrate that first day of the week so long ago that he gave us this incredible hope hope to which we're called, hope of a resurrection. If you're in Christ Jesus, and that is truth for you, and that sustains you, knowing that not only are you saved, but today you will be saved, and one day you will be saved. God's in the win-win-win business, and he's taking care of you today. But if you have yet to receive, as, as uh, John talked about earlier, today's the day to receive these truths and to act upon them. So, and as we do, we are good stewards of what God's given us. So here's some things to think about. I talked about this in the truth. Look for Jesus, look for Jesus, or look for Jesus, learn from Jesus, and lead. Let's talk about what that means. To look is to look to Jesus. I'm reading from Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him 
endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Check this out. Now, if I stood here and said nothing and just went like this and looked, after a while, some of you are going to go, because my attention's directed somewhere else. There's a cross behind you. It came from the original building you used to be here, that used to be here, and now it's, it's up backlit by a little lamp. I love that cross. It reminds me again of looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, right? That is what you do as good stewards. You begin by looking to Jesus. You look to him in all things. When there's distractions around you, when people are trying to pull you away, you go, wait a minute, I'm going to look to Jesus. When the, when the squirrels abound and you can't help but look, you come back and you look to Jesus. You look to him. And then you learn. You learn. In 1 Peter 5, 6, Peter says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. That's verse 7. In due time. When we look to Jesus, we recognize that we're not Jesus. We recognize that we're not God, but that he is. And so therefore we humble ourselves before him. We humble ourselves before him, and in that we learn. Loved ones, if you're not teachable, you're on a path to destruction. You've got to be teachable. You've got to be humble. You've got to recognize you don't got this, but that Jesus does. Look to Jesus, learn from Jesus, and lead with Jesus. And that is just following his examples. In, uh, right after an argument that two of his disciples had on who's going to be the greatest, this is what Jesus said in Matthew 20. He says, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man, speaking of himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We look to Jesus, we learn from him, and we lead as he leads. We lead with him as he teaches us, putting ourselves third, right? God first, others second, ourselves third. So what does this look like, though? What does it look like? In the church, it seems obvious, but it's not always. I mean, let me give you a, a small example. I'm your pastor, but I'm not your shepherd. Even though those words mean the same thing. Pastor is another way of saying shepherd. No, I'm your under-shepherd because Jesus is your shepherd. You see the difference? It's small, but it, it pays, it, it, uh, it uh, has a powerful punch when people need to stay humble. Amen? Yeah, so uh, that's one example. We would look to Jesus, make sure that he's the great shepherd. In the, in the church, we teach often, early and often, that you should be in your word every day, right? On your knees every day, especially during this Lenten season as we build up habits that can go beyond Easter. We learn the power of a redeemed life, and we lead ourselves as we lead others. Some of you are saying to me, Greg, I'm not a leader, and I'm telling you you're, you are a leader of at least one person, and that's you. Loved ones, we are so easily misled. That's why you need to be your own leader, to go to Jesus, to learn from him, and to be strong in the convictions that he's placed upon your life, whether it be in the church, whether it be in the school, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in the community. We look to Jesus, we learn from Jesus, we lead with Jesus, and then when we're done doing that, we rinse and we repeat. We do it over and over and over as he prepares us for him. In your notes, Jesus calls us to be prepared. You look for Jesus, you learn from Jesus, and lead, lead with Jesus. There's a, there's a lot at stake. Jesus knew that as he was teaching. Through, as you read chapter 12, he talks about the fear of the Lord, right? And then as after that, some guy says, hey, you know, be, my, my brother's not sharing his inheritance with me. I want some of his money. He says, okay, wait a minute. That stuff's not the answer. And then he goes on to say, don't be anxious about food, even simple stuff like that. Don't be anxious about what you put on, your clothing. No, don't be anxious at all. And here's, here's what he says just before the, the passage that we read. And I love this because my son, Cameron, used to sing the song. 
Have no fear, little flock. Got to say that carefully. Have no fear, little flock, for the Father has chosen to bring you the kingdom. Have no fear, little flock. You could sing that if you like. We're not going to sing it now. But you can sing it. Why? It's scripture. It begins in verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So sell your possessions. In other words, don't worry about your stuff. Give to the needy. Be generous. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heaven that cannot be, that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's some powerful things that we need to learn from the Lord as he prepares us for the day. Are you ready? Bow your heads, please. Father in heaven, I'm so, so humbled by you that you put up with us. <laughs> you know, we get, we get so easily distracted. We have that sad, pro- that sad problem. We are spiritual attention deficit disorder. <laughs> Lord, forgive us. And I thank you for your patience, your son's love that wells up within us. We don't deserve it, but we'll take it. That grace, the mercy. Jesus, you're so good to us. Thank you that you judge justly. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that those who call upon you will be saved. Thank you that you look beyond what we see today and prepare us for that time with you. Lord, let us be a people who keep our lamps burning, alert and waiting actively. Help us to be good stewards of what you give us, our family, our friends, our jobs, our roles in schools, even our siblings. We thank you that we're stewards in that way. And we thank you in that stewardship that you're trusting us to carry out the responsibilities you give us, rewarding us with more. Help us not to look at those responsibilities as a chore, but a joy. For the who, for the joy that was set before us by you, we seek preparation. Help us to look to you, learn from you, and lead with you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So today uh, is the day of salvation. So if you are, if God's working in your life, come to the altars. Come on this side, you could pray by yourself. On my left, your right. On my right, your left, if you want someone to pray with you, come on up and we will uh, pray together. Would you stand and let's sing. This is a simple song, sing with me. Gentle shepherd. i
sing that. I'm going to anoint someone with oil now. Gentle shepherd. Father in heaven, I, I thank you for being our gentle shepherd and for collecting us together as your saints under shepherds who look to you, learn from you, and lead with you. Lord, each of us have, given, have been given challenges in our lives. So I pray that as we leave this place, that you would lead us through them. Lead us through them to point others to you, to keep those lamps burning brightly, not of our own stuff, but from you working within us. For in our weakness, your strength is made manifest. May we be known as those who put our trust and our faith in you. We ask it in the name of Jesus and all those people said, amen. May God bless you. Go in his peace.